uh, a talk on um, a project to look at uh, dementia and developmental disabilities from two individuals from the ARC of San Francisco, Jennifer Dresden, who is the Chief of Health and Housing Services, and Joanne Roll, who is the Chief of Services, Outcomes, and Compliance. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we're really happy to be here today. I'm Jennifer, Joanne. Um, and we're going to be talking to you today about our experiences and partnership with other expert organizations uh, in their field to improve outcomes for our clients. And before we start, I'd like to uh, give a thanks to Kristen Rains, who is our community support coordinator for the project we ha are going to be talking about. And she put a lot of work into this PowerPoint along with us. So I just wanted to give her a little shout out. I have to. Aha. Uh -huh. There you go. Thank you. Next. Okay. So we have no disclosures. All right. So after the presentation today, we hope you have learned how we have leveraged our expertise among partner organizations, the prevalence of dementia in adults with IDD, how dementia looks different in adults with IDD, how to provide supports with adult, to adults with IDD and dementia, and their caregivers, and we'll provide you with some resources. So a little bit about the project background. In 2016, the San Francisco Department of Aging and Adult Services, also known as DOS, applied for a federal grant from the Administration on Community Living to reach underserved communities. The Alzheimer's Association wanted to access and serve the Chinese community, persons living alone in public housing, and adults with developmental disabilities. The ARC partnered with UCSF to provide dementia evaluations of adults with Down syndrome, both those experiencing symptoms and adults who are asymptomatic. We also reached out to Golden Gate Regional Center to offer training and support to staff, vendors, paid caregivers, and family members. Due to improved healthcare, social services, and a decrease in institutionalization, people with IDD are living longer and more fulfilling lives. According to a 2015 report by the Coalition for Compassionate Care, in 1940, the average lifespan for a person with intellectual and developmental disability was just over 20 years. By 1960, the average life expectancy had, ri had risen to 30 years. Today, the average life expectancy is 65 years, just five years below the general population. For adults with Down syndrome, the average lifespan is now 56. According to the CDC, there are approximately 650,000 adults aged 60 or older with intellectual and developmental disabilities living in the United States. This is projected to double by 2030. As our clients age, they experience the normal aging process, including Alzheimer's disease. The Alzheimer's Association is correct in reaching out to the IDD community. We need to be prepared for that, and we need knowledge to serve our community well. This is how we have partnered to serve the IDD community. These are the project partner roles. So the ARC San Francisco is working on expanding the target audience. We work with other IDD vendors in um, reaching out to expand training. And the trainers are the Alzheimer's Association staff. And UCSF provides evaluations and assessments. And DOS provides monitoring and reporting. So the ARC's role in the partnership is connecting with the other IDD organizations about the need to increase awareness of Alzheimer's and related dementias in the IDD population. The ARC San Francisco is the largest provider of IDD services in San Francisco, and we work closely with other organizations. To work with other IDD organizations, to be open to learning about receiving cross-disability training as it relates to Alzheimer's disease 
and related dementias. And I have to say the IDD community has been very open about wanting more education about Alzheimer's and related dementias. And we work to educate the Alzheimer's Association on the nuances of navigating generic supports in IDD for better outcomes providing education and advocacy to existing resources about how people with IDD and their caregivers are best served. We have a somewhat complicated system that is difficult for those unfamiliar to navigate. We review this with our partner and provide education about this, but most importantly, we open a relationship and extend an invitation to ask for help when needed from our community. So what's the Alzheimer's uh, role in the partnership? Uh, first, to inform the community of IDD vendors of the statistics around Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, particularly the prevalence among adults with Down syndrome. And as you saw in the previous slide, we have a large number of aging individuals with IDD coming down the pipeline that the IDD community needs to be better prepared to serve. Also, the Alzheimer's Association is to deliver the trainings to professionals and caregivers in the community on recognizing signs of dementia, needed environmental modifications, and support strategies. They are also developing a support model for caregivers for us. <clears throat> so where has this led us? Well, it has led us to a belief and understanding that the at the intersection of our two organizations, expertise and knowledge uh, will lead us to the best outcomes for everyone served by the organizations. That we need to take a holistic approach to services and expand one another's knowledge base. And while the IDD community is in the best position to serve individuals with IDD and ADRD, our supports need to be informed by the experts. And a good example of the intersection of our services or our belief systems is that both partners really believe in the ability of an individual to age in place as long as they have the appropriate supports for themselves. So what we have discovered so far, well, it's been an education process for both parties. And one of the most important things that we've learned is that the existing model for the ADRD community and their caregivers does not seamlessly translate to the IDD community and their caregivers. Um, there are fundamental differences between the, those providing caregiving uh, for those with IDD and those without IDD. And so we're gonna look at the differences. Okay, so those differences um, for the general population with ADRD is that they have most of the time living caregivers. In the IDD community, we have somewhat readily up to wraparound services. So we have a lot of people receiving services from family home agencies, board and cares, ILS services, independent living skills, and supported living services, SLS. In the general population for ADRD, there's traditional family relationships. For the IDD community, there are surrogate family relationships. For the general population for ADRD, there's a loss of independence. For IDD community, they're transitioning away from a lifetime of encouraging independence for people. For the general population for ADRD, there are new caregivers for somebody with ADRD. For the IDD community, there's a lifetime of caregiving for the general population of ADRD, the service models, you come to us. And in the service model for the IDD community, we go to you. And then trainings for the general population with ADRD, they're designed for large groups. And for the IDD community, trainings need to be small scale as services are intended for in, to be individualized. And uh, we need to reach everybody. We need to reach people in boarding cares and FHAs. Um, So given these differences, where are we now? Well, we realize that training is critical. The question is who needs to be trained? We have learned that we cannot reach traditional caregivers in the IDD community if it is not able to identify Alzheimer's disease and related dementia and lacks awareness of the resources. We know that professionals are the gateway to the families and individuals in need of supports. <clears throat> 
paid caregivers are supporting older adults, many of whom have lived in their boarding care homes for decades and have surrogate family relationships with them. So where we landed is we need to adapt the current support model in order to meet the needs of the IDD community. So what we'd like to present to you now, and this is a work in progress, are some of the adaptations that will, need, will be needed to make trainings most relevant to the IDD community. The ARC provides a bridge to this as, sometimes we need to make it easier for people to access our information as we manage very complicated systems. Not wanting to make people research two systems themselves, helping them by building the information for them and bridging the gap for them. That's the ARC's role in this project. Most people with IDD parallel the general population with approximately 6% having some form of dementia. However, folks with Down syndrome are at a much greater risk of dementia due to the extra 21st chromosome. It is the 21st chromosome which carries the greatest genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease in the general population. Therefore, people with an extra chromosome are at an even greater risk. Approximately 50% of people with Down syndrome will develop Alzheimer's disease by the age of 60. They also show symptoms at a much younger age when compared to the general population. With some people experiencing symptoms in their early 20s. The earlier the onset, the faster the progression. So what is dementia? Dementia describes a group of symptoms which can, be which can be reversible or progressive. It is diagnosed by a significant change in two of the five categories, memory, language, executive function, perception, and behavior. But it's very important to remember that many individuals in the IDD population are already impacted in those areas. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It's a progressive, degenerative, and irreversible loss of brain cells and neurotransmitters. For the general population, there are standardized tests that can inform a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. However, for the IDD population, these tests are not as effective. Persons with IDD must be compared against their own baseline as they start at a different capacity than the general population. So let's see what that looks like. You often uh, see the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's disease, and this is from the Alzheimer's Association. So for example, number one, with the general population, it's assumed that most people have pretty standard memories. So you're looking for memory loss that disrupts daily life. In the IDD community, someone may have poor recall already. So you're looking at new memory loss that affects their daily life. Same thing with number five. Uh, general population pretty much has a good grasp on visual images and spatial relationships, but someone with an IDD may not, and so you're looking for new troubles um, in this area. So how is a person with IDD diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease? Much in the same way as the general population, namely a review of medical records, interviews with loved ones, and assessments. There are some early warning signs to look for. Behavioral changes such as getting lost or misdirected, being confused in familiar places, exhibiting new memory problems, difficulties with gait and balance, changes in visual perception, changes in personality, and sometimes late onset seizures. However, not all changes indicate the onset of dementia. Common causes of decline not due to Alzheimer's disease include psychiatric disorders, sensory impairment, musculoskeletal problems, and medical conditions. Other health problems that can also mimic signs of dementia include dehydration, fractures, urinary tract infections, adverse drug reactions, and dental or mouth pain. It's important that these be considered and eliminated as potential causes of any observed changes. Caregivers also need to be keenly aware of how the environmental factors can impact an individual's level of functioning. For example, 
a change in caregiver, a change in staff, change in program, a move, a new roommate, or their favorite market closing, all these can cause a person to withdraw, become depressed. Good team communication can alert members to, change, to changes in their routine which are causing the client emotional distress. So if the signs are difficult to judge, how is someone with IDD diagnosed? The process of making a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in someone with IDD is the same as making a di diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, disease with anyone else. Diagnosis is based on a detailed history of progressive change over time in thinking, memory, daily living skills, a physical examination, test of thinking and memory, and investigations to rule out other causes of decline in functioning. In order to establish a baseline, it is recommended that individuals with Down syndrome, in particular, have a professional assessment of communication, memory, and other thinking skills, preferably in their 20s, with a caregiver who has known the individual for many years and performed by a professional with experience working with people with Down syndrome. If a professional assessment is not possible, it is helpful to have copies of educational assessments, speech and language assessments, and psychological evaluations to establish a baseline. The ARC is looking into assessment tools administered with the IDD population, and we've done a lot of work with other organizations that have worked with um, other Alzheimer's organizations. So, in this partnership thus far, here is what we have to offer. Um, first, in January 2018, we, we started a call-in support group for caregivers. Um, it is from 6 to 7 p.m. on the third Thursday of the month. So I guess we have had two now. Um, we've offered the Alzheimer's Care Academy, and that is a three-hour training which provides an overview of Alzheimer's disease and how to care for an individual with dementia. To date, we've trained over 150 professionals and direct caregivers, and those include day program staff, regional center case managers, board and care operators, FHA administrators. We also just started um, offering the Adapting to Alzheimer's Disease, and this is a six-hour training over three weeks, which provides a more in-depth training with opportunities to practice their newly acquired caregiving skills in between classes. Our first class began on February 16th with eight people in attendance. And it's really the Alzheimer's Care, Care Academy and adapting to Alzheimer's disease training, which is where, which is still evolving. Because what we found is that for the professionals coming to the three hour training, they're wanting more, it's not meaty enough. Um, and the adapting to Alzheimer's, it's, it needs to be more directed towards the actual caregivers that we're seeing now with our population. It's the paid caregivers, the surrogate family members. It needs to be more modeled to them versus a family member, a living family member. We're talking about people who have work different shifts. They're not working with the person every day. These are the things we're trying to incorporate into the training so we have something that's more robust for the professionals and caregivers and for our population. Uh, we also are offering, uh, in partnership with the UCSF Memory and Aging Clinic, uh, we can make referrals for evaluations for dementia, and we've referred three people so far. And they are also in partner, we are also in partnership with them, hosting them to offer baseline screenings for individuals in their 20s and 30s who are not experiencing symptoms of dementia, and would but would like to have a formal record of the adapted skills for future reference should they arise, and that's a voluntary program. We haven't started it yet, but that should be starting soon. So how do we support someone with dementia? Uh, there are adaptations to environments and caregiving styles that can reduce agitation, wandering, and confusion. For example, adapting the caregiver's routine to allow for more respite and support staff. Also, adapting the client's routine to a modified schedule which reduces opportunities to wander or become confused. Uh, a big takeaway that I think a lot of us has gotten from the training is adapting one's communication style to say yes to every question, regardless whether the request is reasonable or not. So if someone, I think this is a big example we see a lot, if someone, you're working with a 70-year-old uh, individual and they want to go say hi to their grandmother, go to their grandmother's house. You just say yes. That's great. Let's go do it. 
Adapting the environment to make it easier for individuals with dementia to recognize important rooms, such as the bathroom, while eliminating the confusion of mirrors or shining floors. Okay, and resources that are available. The National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices, the NTG, is the expert in the subject of a, and a rich resource on the topic. They offer a number of publications, training, and resources, including early detection screen for dementia. Many of their resources are free. The Alzheimer's Association is another excellent resource for training and referrals to programs and services. And of course, the ARC San Francisco has a number of services available for free to anyone in the Bay Area. Our call-in support group is available to anyone, regardless of their geographic location. Finally, your client's doctor may be able to refer you to a number of resources, including visiting nurses, medication, and palliative care. And those are just a few additional resources where you can find more information. Thank you.